Okay, here we go. Hey, and welcome. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you happen to be on the grand old internet. I'm Andrew McAllister, your host of Desk Lunch, and I'm very glad to have Julia Forsyth here with me today. And first, before I do a wonderful introduction of Julia Forsyth, I'd like to acknowledge that in Toronto, Canada, that we're on the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians of the land in which we live, work, and create. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Julia Forsyth. Thank you so much for agreeing to um, be here today. And uh, it's, it's, it's so cool. Like, I, I just, like, so we can talk about what's been happening over the last little while with remote teaching and learning. And I know that you've been looking at TikTok quite a lot. And I know my tween is asking me like, can I get TikTok already? And I've been seeing some of these uh, interactions that people are having. And it's like this nascent new technology that people are using to learn and share ideas that in a way that some of the other platforms, I guess, aren't it's doing. It's really interesting. Yeah. I'm, I, I have to confess I'm addicted. It's so interesting. <laughs> but first I will say that I'm coming from St. Catharines and I am on the a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee people who still continue to live and work here today um, and are a great part of our community. That's so great. Thank also, you. it's nice when people are all over the world, we can say where you're you're at. So, yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think you said uh, there's no glory or compensation, but we get to talk about uh, TikTok. And I was like, I'm in. <laughs> but of course, we're going to talk about online learning and remote learning. And, you know, we've been doing this for, I think, uh, decades. I was like, we're ready. We're ready for this. Um, so we're ready. And it's just been sort of getting faculty up to speed. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I, uh, I'm sorry that actually I didn't uh, provide a, a really great introduction for you, Julia. Forsyth is the Associate Director at the Centre for Pedagogical Innovation at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. And we've known each other, full disclosure, uh, for, for quite a long time, but yeah. haven't had an opportunity to do something like this. And I, I, the, my, like my, my secret MO with this was like, I, I, it gives me a chance to talk to Julia more. <laughs> No, it's fun. I watched the one that you did with um, your your friend Sean. Sean who's Armstrong. A boom. Yeah, and I w I just wanted to point out he's a boom operator, right? That yeah. was That's his. And I always wait till the boom operator in the credits because I feel like that's one of the most important roles. So you have to share that with him. And I always <laughs> sing the boom operator because <laughs> it's so important. But I really like this. I think this is a great idea. You should continue to do these things. It's definitely better than doom scrolling, which I um, <sighs> do a lot on my lunch and evenings. Um, it's, so it's relentless. let's escape the doom scroll and talk about more interesting things. Let's talk about how I doom scroll. No. <laughs> yeah, completely. Whoop. I got my, uh, got my notes up here. So, so first of all, um, I wanted to say, let's, let's talk about your edu doodling first, and then we can kind of sure. move on to, to kind of teaching and learning, uh, this fall. And then, and then let's get into TikTok, and then we can squeeze remote proctoring in there somewhere. Um, but uh, you did a TED Talk in 2013, and I wanted to ask you, how long have you been edu-doodling? And if people are kind of wondering what that is, uh, you start and I'll bring it up uh, in, the, in the browser. Yeah. Well, co shout out to Kyle Mackey who's listening. The first time I um, ever edu-doodled was in 2010. I went to, um, I think we went to CNIE, the Canadian Network for Innovation and Education, and we presented on Twitter, if you can imagine. And at that time, I ran into Grant Potter, who told me when I was saying, I love to do, do drawings, like when I take notes, I always doodle and I don't pay attention. And then he told me that was an entire practice and he opened a world to me. And I came back to work and I was like, did you know that this is an actual practice that people do this? And uh they said, well, we should get you a device for that. So I, the first device I ever used was a like the first generation iPad. Um, and then I just started going to conferences and taking notes that way. And it was really for me to make meaning for myself, which was something that was really interesting and fun. Um, and then people resonated with it because it's an interesting way to share, you know, what I took. So it's always, I have to give a like credit to the people who are speaking because they are the, the real brilliance behind it they're just saying amazing things and i'm just kind of making sense of it as it goes um and so then people started inviting me to go to places so now i have like over 400 drawings of different talks but for me they they are grounded in um like the images create these anchors um that allow me to really remember so like now i feel like all of that pd that i've done in the last decade it's been like 10 years now um, I have been able to, I can kind of like picture me drawing it and I think of that talk. So when somebody mentions, a, you know, a theory or a 
you know, or something related to teaching and learning is primarily my focus. I have a little niche area of copyright that I love to do. Um, and what you're showing right now is from the Knowledge Equity Lab, which um, is a, a real important, um, you know, I think that's our uh, ethical um, responsibility in educational technologies to, to be looking at these kinds of things. So I do, now I do projects that are related specifically um, related to that. So, um, and yeah, I do that. Yeah, there's my website. It's great. It's great. I love it. And actually this video is great. And um, I invite uh, folks like after the session to go check it out um, because it, you really talk about how, well, so you're using drawing as a kind of mnemonic and, you know, to a memory yeah. device. And yeah. uh, for like a lot of the the students I serve, you know, they, they're visual learners. And I think you're, you're, you're like working in a, in a comprehensive university. And I'm sure there are folks who aren't, uh, you know, well, I thought I was a visual learner too. And that's something that I always said, and, and this is something that I really want to clarify about the, te the TEDx talk that I gave um, is that I talked about like learning styles, which isn't really a thing. People ha think they have a learning style. So I always thought I was a visual learner, but it turns out that I actually really love listening and drawing helps me be a better listener. And so I think it can deepen my learning uh, by connecting those things, by listening really carefully um, and listening. So people think that they're like, they're, they're more interested in visual practice, but actually it's connecting to many other uh, ways. And so you need to go through a full cycle of all of it. And so I didn't quite say that in the TEDx talk. It's kind of an embarrassment of mine that I, I sort of connected to learning styles, which is not real. Um, but there definitely are preferences and people. And so that's sort of like your entryway into how you, you think that you learn. And that's really important, but it's important for you to go through the full cycle. So, um, but I think audio is really, really important. Um, and so, you know, for anybody who's ever heard me talk about DS106 radio or any other of the radio programs, I just heard Terry and Anne Marie on uh, Hurley in the morning yesterday. Um, and so audio plays an important part, but like making connections and making meaning is the most important thing, whether it's drawing or listening or, you know, or TikToks, which I think is, you know, <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> well, I was going to say, actually, it's a good segue because I think one of the criticisms I've heard sometime with our remote teaching and learning situation is that f faculty and students sometimes are confronted by like walls of text and they're like, oh, how do I digest this? And there's like information overload. And so and there's an encouragement to to use multiple modes of delivery f to help people and so this is i guess a way yeah well yeah if you if you look at uni universal design for learning um the whole idea is that you're you're representing um the things that you want to share you have multiple means so you're going to have text you're going to have images you're going to have video you're going to have audio um and so that there's multiple um it's not just fully accessible across the spectrum of, of accessibility, but it's also multiple access points. And then you're allowing students to demonstrate their knowledge in different ways by allowing them to do those things. So encouraging things like drawing or, you know, or taking a picture or making a video is just uh, broadening the ways that we can show how much we know. And there's, it is so amazing that we have all this technology that we can uh, demonstrate our knowledge in, in, beyond the text. You know, there, the essay is still a really important component um, but um, demonstrating our knowledge can be way more interesting and fun than just, uh, yeah, walls of text. Yeah, yeah. So how are, you know, I was going to actually bring up some of that uh, research that was shared with us, but uh, I haven't <laughs> given actually, and let me pause for a second to say thank you, everybody, uh, Terry Green and Kyle Mackey and Maureen Glenn. Um, who have joined us today and anybody else who's out there in the chat, I will try and refer to the chat um, occasionally. There's four, 14 people watching. That is incredible. I'm, I'm. You promised me nobody would watch, but that's okay. I'm ex uh, hello, 14 people. I'm so happy to see you out there in YouTube land. But like, you know, so the, the Azure, whatever, the technology didn't work. We yeah. were going to try and use the other thing and and we had to come up with, as I call the Roomba method, you have, if it doesn't work one way, you just go to the next thing, right? Yeah. So just before the stream started, I went to go like get my stream key from Behance and actually turn this thing on. And unfortunately it didn't work. Uh, the browser just kept on redirecting and then, uh, hey, Chris Knorr. Um, uh, and it, I couldn't start it. And I contacted, luckily, I have to say uh, some colleagues at Adobe who were absolutely fantastic. I said, hey, it's doing this weird thing. And they were like, 
ah, yes, ah, yes, we've seen that before. That's that's Azure. And I was like, oh boy, you know, uh, hey, Carrie DiPietro uh, and Ashlyn O'Neill. Um, we've seen uh, we've seen that before. Uh, uh, you know, Microsoft's having a bad week. So I was like, oh, oh my goodness, like we've got two minutes left. What should we do? And I was like, well, this is YouTube. We can stream it on YouTube. <laughs> So it's here we are. Just backup plan. Always got to have a backup plan. And also you need a high tolerance for failure and, and you know, resilience to like, it's okay. It happens. It's not you. It's Microsoft. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, nobody's perfect. It's just kind of nice when you know, some, sometimes it's uh, it happens with, with folks like that. Oh, yes, we have to have the requisite drink li uh, lubrication. They told me that was not polite, that they were like, oh, I didn't want to drink tea in front of you. It's like, oh, is that rude? I do that all the time. Oh, that's, no, uh, no. Oh, that's okay, great. Good. Yeah, and patience, Chris. And you're patience. You're Chris is right. Yeah. yeah. So patient. Oh, my God. And backup plans, I think, is the big thing. So, yeah, I'm, I feel like that was really good. You spun that up. You were like, well, I have to make the decision in two minutes. <laughs> And then we went to YouTube and here we are. So thanks guys for um, waiting. Yeah, um, completely. And also too, this is being recorded. So we will uh, be posting it to the various different channels oh, so that you can share it with your colleagues and they can scrub back and forth and all the good things uh, at a later yes, date. Definitely. Avoid eating sloppy joes. Yeah, exactly. I should, I should actually have a meal at, at each one of these things. And like one week I have like spaghetti or something and it's like. That's right. Lobster. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm working on a visual actually for uh, the Aperio Foundation and they want to have, they're talking about like open source is free lunch. And so I was trying to do a bento box that has like, I don't, I'm no, I'm trying to like have like little <laughs> Linuxy type things in it. It's very actually difficult to visualize. <laughs> so actually just before we move on from your drawing and actually I'll flip back to, um, oh no, that's TikTok. Um, so, so you started with like because I'll I'll satisfy the uh, the 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 nerdy creative part of this, and then we can move on to other topics. So, are you still using um, an iPad to draw these, and what are you using to no. draw? No, so because I work in faculty development and um, and supporting teaching and learning, I actually and I started using iPads in the beginning. I had a lot of people who needed a full fledged machine, and so a lot of people were purchasing the Surface, and they would come to me and be like how do I do what you're doing on this? Uh, and so when it was time to upgrade, I thought maybe I would also um, switch to a Surface. Um, so now I use a, and I also really appreciate a file structure, which the iPad just did not provide me. I really like to know where my files are. I'm just a little bit old school that way to know I need a directory. Yeah. <laughs> and where is I, it I just, going? You know, getting files in and out were really frustrating, but it's actually great to have a full fledged computer that I can also, you know, uh, flip and do other things, go into the learning management system or send an email. So I'm using a surface now, but I'm using the, the app that I started using right from the beginning. It's free. It's and it's but it's available on the PC. Um, uh, which is Autodesk Sketchbook Pro. Yeah. I do use Photoshop and Illustrator for projects that um, need to go to print that are high, that need to be scalable and high resolution. Um, so I do use that for some things, but it's not, um, it's not as fast and agile as just a, like a slim little app. The big thing that I need are layers. And so that's my, like, it has to have layers because um, I do my black line drawing first. And then when people start talking are answering questions that aren't questions, but really just comments, that's when I can color in. Um, and so under underneath on a different layer. That's interesting um, how your drawing process like follows the arc of a conversation in a in a get together where it's like the meat is like right up front and then like, well, yeah, yeah, sort of trails off <laughs> a little bit. And then you start of, filling it in. Yeah. yeah. But the one that you're showing now, I really love because it was um, it was really a sharing activity. And so this was more of a harvest. This was a full conversation of people sharing their perspectives. And so people who do graphic facilitation are so skilled in this that they will, they will actually facilitate a conversation and then draw and harvest the ideas. Uh, like world cafes are done like that, which is a lot more difficult. And I'm not as skilled as many, many people who, who do this like on big pieces of paper. Um, but um, usually I'm just sort of like the quiet listener um, but, and so somebody else was facilitating. So I was just taking notes from a bunch of people, but these were um, people part of this knowledge equity lab that's out of U of T uh, with Leslie Chan. And uh, there was like about a dozen people there and they were all sharing their perspectives and their projects. And so that was like, to me, that was a really fun thing because it was sort of, they, they were so happy to have things represented of all their ideas in a way that just wasn't linear notes, right? 
And so they turned that into a, a video. Yeah, you were asking about um, animation, if I ever wanted to make things move. That's yeah. so much more work. So I'm always, yeah. I always usually just give the drawing to, to some more talented people who do animate it. Uh, there's a project with the copyright, um, with the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, and the University of Waterloo is now animating my um, Adobe Illustrator doodles. So I did them in Illustrator as doodles, and now they're animating them because they're all vectored and stuff. Yeah, because so. I was, I was, you took the words out of my mouth. I was just going to say, well, you'd have to draw it as a vector-based object so that you can separate it from the background, and then you know. Exactly, exactly, and so you kind of need to know that from the from the beginning, right? right. Um, so if it's just note taking, you know, if I'm if for my own personal use, I probably just use a light app. But if it's something like a bigger project, then I will make sure it's a vector-based. Yeah, and I guess. Um, okay. I lost that thought. No, never mind. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh, cause, oh, I was going to say, and also some of these apps aren't available on the service pro yet. Like I was going to say, have you played with Adobe Fresco, but like that's iPad only right it's now. It's iPad. Yeah. I looked that up. I was like, oh, a new app. I'll try it out. Yeah, like, oh, great. Uh, Travis is asking if I ever do live share. And I do, I have done that quite a few times. I've been invited onto panels and while my panel is discussing, I will draw. I've done that. Um, a lot. I thought about doing it for this but we had enough technical fun things that i thought oh, you know we'll just reduce the barrier well we'll have um, you so back that knowledge on. equity i shared that when as i was drawing it for that lab um the the ted talk the tedx talk was actually i was live drawing everybody's everybody else's tedx talk so i was last and so and so my my drawing was projected in between <laughs> the talks and then at the end I had to show all the drawings that I did so I felt like that was some kind of drawing Olympics that was very stressful actually <laughs> but um but I have done it um I think I went to an open forum in BC that's where I did it uh the first time and they just projected up on screen as as people were talking and then I took notes and people yeah. liked it somebody told me at cast uh the the UDL folks they 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 said that it was like um transcription visual uh graphic transcription right so yeah. like it was a way of seeing what people were saying in a different way which i thought was kind of cool yeah it, it's great I, I i really enjoy it and it makes me think about how you know in many of the remote learning contexts people want tools that do things like whiteboarding and i've seen some tools that are very structured and sometimes i think well is that what people really want? They want something like, like there's so much to be gained by something like this where it's very free form. Um, so on that happy note, <laughs> I'm just gonna return to the chat. Travis says, thank you, very cool. Thanks for sharing about that. So thank you, Travis, for asking the fantastic question, actually. Uh, we, we, love, we love good questions. Um, just gonna turn back to my notes. And so we talked a little bit about, uh, so how are your, um, so how, how, how do you think in general learners are doing this, this fall with this remote teaching context and, and some yeah. of our instructors? And you, you shared, um, or you mentioned the, the University of Waterloo, they did a survey in the spring and I skimmed it over and I feel like it, a lot of the, the themes apply the, there's sort of this, um, perception versus reality. So I know that a lot of students, and I'm not talking about my institution, but generally um, are, are you know wondering whether online is equivalent. And I've been trying to promote this idea that we can connect in ways that we never could before. And so we're seeing some really um, awesome things happening that way, where you're getting guest speakers, you're getting the person that you're reading the article um, about being able to come to the class as a guest speaker. Um, you're seeing people um, creating and collaborating in ways that they really couldn't do in the classroom. We're running a pilot. Oh yeah, pitch to eCampus Ontario. I'm on a panel tomorrow to talk about social annotation. Um, so we're we're running a pilot now with like some fairly large classes at um, trying to to get at the text in a way that you probably couldn't have done just sitting in seminar. It was pretty easy to sit in seminar before and be like, mm-hmm. I agree with, with what she said, um, but now they have like these five different annotations and so they have to really highlight sections of the text and, and really look at, um, you know, do you have any questions? What are the interests? What are the, what do you, what does this remind you of? Um, and so I think the learning is a lot deeper, but students are saying it's, it's really challenging. We have technology challenges, as you know, um, and it, I think the workload is, 
is maybe a little bit high where that's, I think what um, the Waterloo survey said, and I'm hearing a little bit of that too, um, because it's, it's really shifting kind of the way I've always said, you know, you, you do an online course, you don't go to an online course, like there's a lot to do. Um, so it really has to, it's a mind shift of how you're approaching it. And so I think there's a little bit of growing, you know, and so I've just actually asked all our faculty, well, in our newsletter, we're like, you should send out a formative feedback and get solicit and find out like, how's it going? How is the workload? Because you can scale it back a bit, you know, and maybe adjust, um, or maybe they need more from you. Like what, what do they need? Uh, it's our first time through and it's, it's really okay to say, you know, this is my first time through and I just want to make sure that we're doing okay here. And so I feel like it's going really well. Um, there's not been any explosions except for ones that were completely out of our control that would like affected the whole world, as you know. Yeah. So for the most part, it's been um, pretty, pretty good. Uh, fingers crossed, knock on wood and all that stuff. Yeah, I think yeah. that's my impression as well, too. And I think it's also like some of the things that we thought were going to be problems like they do they do crop up and and it's interesting actually also being on social media as well too on Twitter and and having this kind of I'd say a community of colleagues who are kind of espousing a lot of best practices but they're also kind of revealing some of the things that are like terrifying that that some folks are doing and uh, we we could segue there to remote proctoring <laughs> yes. Although I do want to give a shout out to Ashlyn, who, uh, Ashley, who noticed Ashlyn noticed that I have my don't panic book, which I do keep by my side at all the time, because it is a message to everybody that we're going to get through this. And no matter what happens, we're going to be OK. Don't don't read too much into the what the content of that book is, because the world does explode there. But, you know, let's, <laughs> let's not worry too much there. So Carrie asked a really good question that I'll pick up on and move to, which is, Julia, have, here have your conversations about online learning intersected with questions of access and equity, affordances of technology for greater inclusion, et cetera? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I'm always like, um, tech, online learning is a social justice issue. Um, we have, you know, we're in Canada and there are communities that do not have broadband access and cannot access these things. So we need to... Um, be flexible and resilient and create structures that can allow people like, so just access the technology. And then once you're actually using it, you have to think about how you're representing the information so that's the most accessible possible. And if that means like captioning on your videos, not making your videos uh, really long, because even if they do have access, what if they're accessing from their phone and they're using a cellular plan? Um, so there's all these considerations that I think are so important um, and I'll just, go to um, like one of the, the big things is this ethical ed tech is a big, um, uh, I'm a, a strong proponent of, and maybe Terry will, will share it in the chat because he always does whenever I mention it. There's a great website talking about how we can be ethical with our approaches to educational technology. Okay, we're relying on you, Terry. <laughs> um, <laughs> like he's like, I'm eating my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> little busy, little busy. I'm, I'm a participant. I have it somewhere. I can do it. <laughs> um, but actually, uh, so Carrie actually just added on to his question, how have your conversations intersected? Like, I agree. Um, yeah, definitely broadband access. And, and I know some of the guidance we were giving to people about how good should their internet access be. We're like, well, there's this plan, you know, that the federal government is trying to enact. And my goodness, wouldn't it be great if that plan was implemented by now, you know, but it's looking yeah. forward to the future. And, and what I find, what I found interesting is how we suspected some things were going to be a problem for students in terms of equity and access for students who, let's say, are in shared living situations. It becomes highly revealing about, you know, and, and, you know, they're in, they're in personal spaces where they're sharing it with other people. And, and it's like, they don't want to turn their cameras on and, and it's completely valid. Yeah. It's completely valid. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, they might not have a space where they can. I've carefully curated this background for you. I know it looks messy, but I actually, this is, you know, like I spent a lot of time being able to do that. Not everybody has that privilege that they have a space where they can have a background. They're like in their bedrooms. Um, but I think he, um, Carrie's point is a really interesting one uh, talking about assessment, which um, is something that I spent a lot of time talking to faculty about. Um, in, as soon as we had to do the pivot to online in March, a lot of people were like, but how are we gonna do our exams? And so I created a flow chart of, um, you know, well, actually my team, we, our team created a flow chart and we said, you know, have you met your learning outcomes? Maybe you can just readjust and, and re, re 
um, oh, no, no, you can't do that. Okay. So it was like a, if this, then that. Um, and so if it came down to, you actually had to have a fully, you had to have an exam, you need to test people. A lot of people were asking for, um, you know, these surveillance technologies. Um, and so for the, the access reasons that I just mentioned before, those, that's why the proctoring software is hugely problematic. And then when you get down to the bottom, it's even questionable whether it even works. And, you know, so it's just creating a, um, I can't remember who says it, it's on Twitter, maybe somebody in the chat will tell us, but they call it, that's cop shit, right? <laughs> Like that's, stop being, you don't need, like what kind of environment, learning environment are we trying to create when we need to just watch you? And so in my, uh, one of my presentations, I showed the Panopticon, which is hilarious that there's a tool called Panoptico. That's a whole other thing. But, yeah, completely. You know, I show, showed the jail, right? And everybody's in their jail cells and you're in your tower and you can watch everybody, right? So that's like a utilitarian philosophy of like, if you watch people and then Foucault said, you know, this, this, this surveillance, like that people will behave because they're being surveilled. But is that really the kind of learning environment that we want to be fostering? Yeah, completely. So like, there's a whole range of ethical problems with that approach. I guess my, what, um, what chafes me about it is that it sort of sets up this immediately like negative dynamic with the students where it's like, we know that some of you are going to cheat. It doesn't set up a dynamic yeah. where it's like, Hey, learners, we know that you're here to like broaden your perspectives and you're trying to advance your your life and become a whole human being. And like you're looking forward to being a career or something like that. No, no, no. We're going to focus on cheating. <laughs> but when was the last time you had a task that you weren't able to collaborate with people that you had to do completely by yourself? Like really, for real, in, in 2020, given this global context, when did you have to solve problems that you didn't look it up online to find out how to do it or that you weren't researching or that you didn't reach out to somebody? Like, I, I just feel like it doesn't represent the way that we actually solve problems. And we have really complex problems. It's not like... I mean, I think we need to move beyond just naming parts of, you know, a system like, yes, it, I understand for mathematics, it really is important. And for like, you know, if you look at Bloom's taxonomy, we do need to have that knowledge base and you do need to like commit things to memory in order for you to go to higher level learning. But I don't know if that's like the end of it. That's the beginning, <laughs> you know? So yes, you need to give opportunities to make sure that you have that base knowledge, but that's not what the goal is. Like we're trying to create you know, like citizens who can solve like this, like amazingly complex issues that are facing um, this world right now. Like these aren't little problems. So I wish we would think that way and be preparing people for that as opposed to like, I'm going to watch you and make sure that you're, you're not looking up something that is easily retrievable online. It was like, then why, who cares if it's easily retrievable online? I, I don't know. It's, it feels it feels, and it's an arms race is what we've always said in our center. So I'm really proud of Brock. We've actually said we're not supporting proctoring software. Yeah, um, We ran it as a pilot. We tested it. We're not ever like saying it widely, but I feel like we should. It's like a, you know, there's a lot of problems with it. Yeah, actually props to our faculty curriculum development center at OCAD University, um, Susan Ferguson and Carrie DiPietro and Travis Freeman and Tori Moss and those folks who were like, yeah, no, we're going to provide flexible ways of students responding to um, the assignments and we're not going, you know, take home exams or, you know, projects or something like that and, and that we weren't going to pursue it. And me from a technology perspective, I was like, that stuff is looks really hard to manage. And also coming back to the whole equity question, like an equity nightmare, you know, with students who um, I've seen posts on Twitter with, uh, you know, Students, pe people of color, people uh, who have oh. face coverings, you know, and and it's that's their personhood. And then you're asking them to do what exactly in order to comply with some piece of technology that is not really that great. And as you say, probably doesn't do what yeah. it's supposed to do. Anyway. Well, and the one that uh, the one TikTok that was going viral that made its way to Twitter and I shared with you and with lots of people um, was that poor girl who was reading to herself and because she was moving her lips which is like a known um, learning practice. It's actually a really good practice to do, um, you know, um, like out loud speech to talk through a problem or a solution. And so she was doing that. And so the software picked up that she was talking 
therefore she must have been talking to somebody else and therefore she must have been cheating. And so she actually got a zero on that. And then her scholarship was at risk. And then she was going to get evicted from her apartment. Like there's this whole trickle effect um, of just like this really simple thing was like, you know, I mean, a human should have looked and seen that she was just sort of talking through it herself. But I don't know, we can't rely on robots for everything. I mean, I love robots, but we're not going to let them decide um, everything. Well, speaking of which, that's a nice segue. Like, actually, let's uh, let's bust open. So you've been uh, at several different meetings that we've attended. You've said like, oh, I'm on TikTok. I'm like checking out what the kids are doing. And I'm like, this is really interesting to me because like I have a tween who's on TikTok. And, you know, of course, there was that a whole news cycle around the security issues with TikTok and like all the conspiracy yes. theories around surveillance yes. and so on and so forth. And and a lot of it probably um, some of it probably racist. I will and... say I, I do use a burner phone for it. So I have I, and there's a point of privilege too, right? I have one phone that I just use for TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> um, but because I am concerned about that, but I'm not sure it does any more surveillance than Facebook or Amazon or Google or, you know, I read surveillance capitalism. I think that's the new model. That's how most of this technology is operating. Yeah. Um, but I guess because it's a foreign power, um, it's a little bit more problematic, but there's this great article called TikTok in the sorting hat that talks about the algorithm and and, um, you know, the kids kind of have figured out a way for, <laughs> they do a lot of video that doesn't match the audio um, because the people who are doing the content moderation actually don't even speak English. They're just using, you know, their AI to generate, to do it. It's very interesting. Um, I don't know. I really enjoy TikTok because I feel like the kids are all right. <laughs> These kids are, are super, they're, they're with it and they're woke and they're, you know, I feel, I feel confident in the next generation. Um, I feel ancient because <laughs> there's, <laughs> they are, um, you know, 15. <laughs> so, but you know, my daughter, my daughter's 21. She's actually on the old end of it. And I think that's what happened is that she used to send me TikToks that were so specific. I felt like they were, I was like, wow, that's like really you know, our relationship in a nutshell, like kind of comments. Um, that's a big thing is that people send each other TikToks. Um, I would watch them. And so then I fell out down a, like a TikTok hole because of that. <laughs> that's amazing. Like, actually, it's funny because like my daughter was sharing some with me and then I was like, oh, she's learning. Like I see learning happening. So I'm like, well, yeah. I can't just be all negative and grumpy about it. Like, well, and I think that the one, the, one, the one thing that I thought would be super, really interesting is how much you can actually convey in a minute, so, you know, like how, how much can you say in 59 seconds? It's so short. It seems so short, but they are forced to be to the point, concise. Um, some of it is really silly and, you know, not great, but there really are people, there are a lot of academics or um, grad students who, who share some really kind of big ideas in these little chunks and they're really interesting well do you want to so. do you want to share some i can i can fire them up here uh for us yeah did you get a chance to i, I was kind of like oh I, I so the other thing about this sorting hat is that um it puts you in these subcultures right and so uh and it says when you gaze into TikTok, it gazes back at you and so so i remember telling somebody like that and they're like oh so like what kinds do you think what kinds of things do you see and i was like uh never mind <laughs> Because it's it's a little bit like, you know, anyway, um, you, the internet is like this, you know, they have the islands and, you know, there's always the like subreddits and sub communities. Right. It's um, your echo chamber. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the algorithm is really strong in that it doesn't show you other things. And so I was sort of, I was trying to find like what I was seeking with things about what are student perspectives of online learning? Um, so there's a lot of people... <laughs> Interestingly, like they have their phone and they'll be like recording the Zoom oh, yeah. meeting. Here, let's uh, stuff like that happens. Do you want to fire one of those up? M to the B. Do you know what that is? M to the B. No. Okay, so one girl, the the most viewed TikTok video currently is this one 19 year old girl from Hawaii who basically just does this face thing, and it's become an entire meme unto itself. Um, Here, hold and on. So Let me, these. Uh... Shall I? I'll unmute the uh, the audio. Hold on. Uh. I don't know if they'll actually play. I don't know if the audio Wait. is. Exactly yeah, what are you doing with your head? This class coordinated you to, to do that meme 
and the instructor was like, what is going on? That's wild. So they did this in the class. Yeah, that's the Zoom class. Your syllabus. <laughs> and, and if you look really close, there's even a dog doing it on the top left, our middle <laughs> left. <laughs> it's anyway. Oh my God. It's amazing. <laughs> it's really interesting. The other one that I thought was interesting um, is the the tweet I sent you about. It was just that um, my friend Allison posted yesterday sharing with somebody else's thing about how you can build on it. So it gets around copyright by using like these 30 second clips, um, but you can create original content. So basically you can reuse, this is like ultimate remix reuse kind of um, idea where you can take a sound clip and you can lip sync it or you can add audio to it. So this guy does like his own musical about a grocery store. This is original content that he's oh, like. And then if you scroll down, We're somebody standing. can duet it. And so they, it, they become side by side. So he's the grocery store guy. And then, then she adds her part singing and it's done very much like a, um, a musical. And so she's the wife. And then if you scroll down, there's a daughter. Oh my God. And then scroll down, there's the employee, which is great because they're having like this conversation in the grocery store. And, and the employee's like, we close at nine. And then there's a can of soup get, get added. Oh it's amazing. <laughs> um, but I love, so I love the virality of it, but also the idea that you're taking, you're taking and building, right? And so how can you be creative to something else? And so, so a lot of times it started, um, I don't know if you know this, but TikTok started as Musical.ly. So when my daughter was 14, she would do like these lip syncing things. And it was mostly teen girls in North America that, that were, were playing with this, just doing lip syncing songs. So that's how it started. And it was using popular music, but now you can add your own sounds or you can bring in sounds. And so there's this idea of, um, it, you know, a certain sound becomes an idea and then you put your twist on it. I don't know if you've seen how Fleetwood Mac has like tripled it's sales no. of this one song. Really? Oh, I didn't send you this one. There's this guy and he's skateboarding, drinking cranberry oh, juice. Yes. To Fleetwood Sorry, Mac, I have seen that. Right. And so now like everybody is replicating it. And I, there may or may not be a video of me in a shopping cart with a milk bag trying to do my, my take on it, but <laughs> I can't, I can't post these things publicly, but they entertain me a great deal. And I'll just describe them instead. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, but there's, I, so as a teaching and learning thing, I'm just going back to this, I think there's something really core about taking like this, like what is the essence of the idea? What does it mean? And this is like connected to my other thing about making meaning between, you know, what, what you're hearing and then how, do, how can you relate it to yourself? And it's so, I find it really interesting. Surveillance issues. Yeah, aside. aside. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, no, and also too, like, um, this is not meant to be a, a knock at my, uh, you know, Adobe who I love and whatever, like they have, they have a, a tool for, for creating social videos. And I think, I don't know whether it was somebody in a meeting I was in, they were like, you need to create a video editor. That's as like, as addictive to use as the one in TikTok. Yes. So, can you see the transitions that they do? Like, so you're re you're be able to reuse audio really simply. That's, a, that's built into the editor. They have these a bazillion filters that you can do and then you can edit. So like, I don't know if you've ever seen, like they do like these clothes transitions mm -hmm. really, you know, or white <laughs> transitions. And I've never seen a video editor, you know, you're doing it on your phone. Like, I feel like they should just sell that editor, but I mean, it's tied to the whole platform. Right. But, but what can you do in one minute using video is what I try and take away. And so I, you know, if people can communicate this way and we're recognizing that people can communicate this way, like even if it's just an intro video, like, could you do, you know, could you choose a meme and make a video? You can download it and share it other places. So I'm, I, I feel like there's, there's a germination of something that's interesting there. I, f I feel like I don't want to promote it because I, I know that it can be problematic, but I'm also completely, I have to confess, addicted. To yeah. It. Well, it, it kind of underlines this idea, like I've mentioned this before, like David O. White talks about presence, like bringing presence to your course. And like, it's bringing presence in a very frictionless way. And I think part of the problem with some ed tech tools is that there's just so much friction. Like they, they're just not very mature. And part of it is that they have a different business model. They have different user base. They don't 
have maybe the same scale of development team that is like constantly innovating to build that product and, and um, modify it. But it does underline the utility of video. Right. Yes. Yeah. Actually, there, I'm not sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to like a lot of tools that are built for education. Don't think broadly enough about like fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think as, having fun is a really important part of learning, like connecting and making meaning is a really important part. And I feel like we should, like, it should be fun. I don't think it should be painful. Learning doesn't need to be painful. Yeah, it was like so. when I when I first opened Teams and I was like, there were all these emoji and, you know, animated GIFs and stickers and like all this stuff. At first I was like, oh, is this really a serious uh, learning tool for our students? And then I was like, no, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, I actually I love well, I've always loved the use of gifts like um, to can to convey a, an emotion. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit on the unprofessional side because I use it too much. But <laughs> yeah, me too. So you're in good company. OK, good, good. <laughs> um, I was going to see if I could um, play another uh, really great TikTok that actually um, that you had already known about that my. Uh, oh, yeah, the ghost honey, the art do the art one yeah yeah i'm gonna pull it up here just in just a second i didn't have it uh, at my fingertips copy link he's so funny he has a really great um that's the other thing is that they're really um countering the notion of celebrity because you know everyday people are hilarious yeah they're very clever and astute yeah and yeah yeah so we'll see we'll see what we can do here who would like so to they can hear this audio yeah. yeah i can go next uh this is my two-day figure painting study I think it was really good practice. Please don't take this the wrong way, but I just wanted to say you don't know what you're talking about. It's 9 a.m. Uh, thank you for the note. I love that you censored his manhood, yet he's grabbing a staff so eagerly. It's both ironic and erotic. Cool. I um, actually just accidentally spilled coffee on his um noodle right before class, so I put a smiley face there. Have you considered painting nude? I like the colors. Thank you. But I hate that you used paint. It's a painting class. Wait, what did you <laughs> use? Blood. Really good points, everybody. Tyler, I think you should consider painting nude. You're so tense, like a little clam. Don't be afraid to get vulnerable. Quick cigarette break, everybody. When we get back, we have 23 more paintings to go through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it, like, I, I've... So, full disclosure, I... I, I'm not an OCAD graduate. I didn't, um, I actually did though. My, my critique experience is from, um, actually Ryerson, uh, university. I went to Ryerson for a year and also I went to Goldsmiths college and, uh, that, that was not exactly my experience, <laughs> but I've, <laughs> I gather from, from other institutions that right. this is kind of what happens at other institutions, uh, and that possibly I, I couldn't speak to it, but he is very funny. I think he's hilarious. Um, I love I just lo I love his delivery. And so, again, just getting back to the editing, see how many cut like how many cut scenes are in yeah. like a, a one minute. And he it's really easy to do on the phone, which is the other thing that I think is a takeaway is that it shouldn't be this difficult, like in 2020 for us to make a little video on our phone. Well, um, also, too, I think it's kind of like a great critique of critiques like. <laughs> Like, yes. honestly, the, the quality of some of that feedback is like, oh, it's not, you know, and, and I remember, actually, I do remember in some of my critiques, I was like, what is, what are they talking about? Like, what is, no, I, you know, and, and people like not being engaged. And so like coming, like pulling full circle back to the whole remote teaching and learning situation and it being kind of silver lining an opportunity for us to change our practice, um, yeah, doing some of these things synchronously in person, like there's a sense of loss around not doing them anymore. On the other hand, we have to take a moment, and I don't know who it was on Twitter, not me, who said we should think about, um, oh, you know who it was? I think it was Daniel Stanford, where he was like, people who complain about online learning uh, like wildly overestimate the quality of our in-person experiences and radically underestimate the quality of like the online learning experience where you know, stuff like this, you know, people who are not super engaged and giving like really questionable yeah. feedback. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, th that's one thing that this has um, shown is the, the spectrum of activities that were happening in the classroom. Um, I think with online learning, it really 
makes that visible. It's been quite, um, you know, because there's like this recording and collection, you can kind of look at it. Whereas what happens to the classroom is very ephemeral and difficult to, you know, no, you close the door and it's been so private. Um, so I think there's been, it, that's been interesting. But for the most part, there's like really cool stuff that can happen online. I love how he's just looping on my yeah, Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's it's crazy. I should I should I should flip it back to uh we'll, we'll flip it back to uh the main view cuz uh here we go cuz that's distracting. Now of course my cat's here. You might hear some meowing so uh, Oh good. My cat <laughs> usually shows up when I start talking too, but not yet. <laughs> Well, um, I like to keep this uh, nice and, you know, uh, tight, usually tight. to try and wrap it up at uh, at one thirty. But uh, any prognostication about the future, the future churcher of learning, like, do you, is, is anything going to be the same, you know, when we go back? Is, is, is everybody just going to be like, oh, so glad that's over. I'm now going to go back to the classroom and, you know. Well, my favorite conversations have included, I really feel like this has changed my teaching for the better. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing my, you know, students again and, you know, and, and being in the same room with them, but there are so many things that I'm going to keep because this was amazing. And so I, I'm looking forward to that. I think like, you know, freeing up classroom space so that you can do a lot of those things on your own to be more prepared for class, which is the flip thing that we've been talking about for a long time, but I feel like that will definitely probably carry forward, um, my, um, RVP talks about holding the gains because there's been a lot of actual real progress progress that has been made and so we should keep the best parts of this so that when we come back hopefully soon enough um that we will you know leapfrog into this new newer future and i feel like it has a lot of you know workplace and you know life implications if we can think that way i think it will probably be for the better i'm really hoping <laughs> i'm really i like i'm clinging to the optimism on that one yeah myself as well too because i i have seen lots of great feedback from uh, some faculty, but then also students saying, you know, actually this asynchronous learning thing really works for me, or I like a mixture of the two, uh, or I'd like to go back to some sort of state where I could have both because it helps yeah. me learn. And I think, yeah. I think we agreed that would be a, a better state. I, I, I miss the, you mean, you know, what you miss is the, the hallway that, you know, like the in-between things, that, yeah. like that's a really magical part. You don't have the same kind of serendipity. And so I'm looking forward to those things coming back. But a lot of these structured things can be done and organized in a way to really improve connections and communication. So that's that's my wish. And also that we do it ethically. <laughs> Sustainably, inclusively. Sustainably and ethically. And we, you know, and, and with a human first approach. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's been very fun. And thank you to all the people listening. Um, yes. Fun professional, my uh, my fun professional colleagues, <laughs> our yeah. fun professional colleagues. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you, Travis. Holding the gains. I think that's a great uh, thing to uh, uh, thing to go out on. So uh, Julia, I want to thank you so much for setting this time aside for us to chat. Maybe we'll do it again in the future. Maybe we'll do like a like end of semester roundup where we can. That sounds of, great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can... can't wait to tune into your next guest because this has been uh, these are fun. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying. It's an no pressure. It's an experiment. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. There is pressure. But I have to say it's also excitement, too, where it's like, oh, you know, this has to happen. And. I actually feel a lot for the faculty who are trying to hold these synchronous classes who are like, let's go to oh, work. Yeah. You know, oh, it's so it's so challenging. I know yeah. empathy is our biggest tool right now, for sure. Well, on that note, I want to thank all of you for attending on, there on the bold wide world uh, Internet, uh, whether it's morning, afternoon or evening for you. Don't panic, you know, and uh, I always like to uh, end my keynote with guest. Oh, let's uh, we always like to end off with uh, let's see if we can go to the end here. And oops. We want to make sure that all of you stay safe and stay sane because that's the most important thing and uh, have a great week. Oh, and for those Canadian viewers, happy Thanksgiving as you celebrate. Oh, yeah. That's right. In your household with no one else. With your small bubbles. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.